Welcome to season three of MIGS Unplugged. My name is Ike Ahmed from the University of Toronto. With me I have Valentino Lozano, also known as Gator Surgeon, and I have Jeb Ong, also known as Jeb Ong. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about learning MIGS. Uh, both, of, uh, both Valentina and Jeb, you both have been learning MIGS over the last year or so as fellows. Can you share some pearls about surgeons who are starting to learn MIGS and going through that learning process? Yeah, so I think before starting any type of MIGS procedure, it's crucial to learn how to get a good visualization of the angle. I mean, nothing worse than already being so nervous starting to learn a new procedure and then being in there in the anterior chamber and not being able to see uh, what you're doing. So one of the things that I found really helpful during residency was actually pretending that we were going to do a mixed procedure. So every time that we had a FACO alone case, um, at the end of the case we would go and do everything pretending that we had that. So we would just rotate the patient's head, we would tilt the scope, put that OBD on top of the cornea, use the Swans Jacob, and even use the tip of the cannula of the yeah. OBD to just go inside and just point at the TM. So that was very helpful and you got really comfortable doing that. So whenever you go and do the real mix procedure, you have one step that you're already nailed. Well, that's so. great. Joe, what about you? Yeah, so I think, you know, that, that definitely is a key point in terms of the on fast view, we call it. Um, kind of making sure the patient's head is turned over properly, your scope is tilted properly, and then kind of really not getting that top-down view, which makes things very difficult, knowing where you are in the angle, right, before you actually implant. So kind of echoing what you're saying, Valentina, I do think visualization probably is part of the, the number one thing you really need to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I hear, we hear a lot about top-down view and on fast view. And I, maybe you could just go into that a bit more because I think a view is one thing, but to get the optimal view and why a certain view is preferred, I mean, maybe you can get into that a bit in terms of how do you get that? So this is really the part where, again, it's, it's a combination of, of factors, right? Making sure the patient's, held is, the patient's head is tilted properly, your scope is tilted the right amount, and then from what you're looking at, basically unfast just means that you're clearly kind of seeing every single structure of that angle, right? Whereas top down, a lot of times it's, you're kind of only seeing a little bit of the TM and so it's hard to know where you really are, especially when you're going with either your eye stand, your hydrus, or whatever device that you're using. Um, so that's really kind of what we mean by that unfast view, so you get a clear view of every single structure and it makes it a lot easier. And I mean, we talk about tilting the scope and, and the head. I mean, any guidelines in terms of what you use to tilt uh, enough or? Yes. So typically about 30, 40 degrees tilt in the scope, um, just turn the patient, patient as much as you can. Um, it's also very helpful, for example, if you're doing a right eye procedure to ask the patient to look the opposite way and that sometimes opens the angle a lot. Uh, you will be surprised how many times uh, that can help. And of course, using significant amount of OBD, that way you can open the angle much more and not push down so much on the Swan Jacob lens because that can just take all the OBD that just just placed out of the eye. And that's where the practicing, like you said, beforehand with, uh, with the Swan Jacob through an incision during routine cataract surgery can help. I mean, I, I think visualization, as you both have said, has been, has been, is key to get, you know, start to do MIGS. So one of the problems that when surgeons are far, starting to do MIGS is that you get stria on the cornea, where the view becomes difficult. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the causes of stria and, and how do you address them? Right, so most of the time it's just because you're pushing too hard with your Swan Jacob lens. Um, typically, if you're a right-hander surgeon, you're worried so much about placing that mix procedure so you forget about your other hand. So that's very important to think about whenever you're trying to do that mix procedure is that you also focus on the other hand and not press down so hard. Jeb, tell us some more pearls about... Uh, yeah, so I think another cause for striae that can occur, right, is actually with your main instrument. So either it's the, your, your injector for whatever device you're using, what I, I've noticed is that it can actually help you to look at the way the striae actually look, right? So if, if you're pushing down on your temporal incision, typically the striae you see are actually pointing towards the incision, so you can kind of tell, is it my left hand that's pushing down too much with my Swan Jacobs, or is it actually my main instrument that I'm pushing down on the uh, lip of my uh, temporal incision, right? So that actually helps to look at the way it looks. Uh, just a word of caution for OVD inside the eye, we typically say we don't want to overpressurize the eye, because what ends up happening is that Schlem's canal can actually collapse and it makes it more difficult to get our, our device in. Um, so there's a fine balance in terms of knowing how much to put in so that your visualization is optimal, but at the same time not be counterproductive, right, for your actual insertion afterwards. So how much do you think? Yeah, I don't think there's a certain amount because it depends on the insertion chamber of every eye, right? Every eye is a bit different. So a lot of it is kind of getting a good feel for it, knowing how not to overpressurize an eye. That maybe is a bit more of an art 
you kind of have to learn, unfortunately. But I think here we say typically an ideal pressure is about like 25 to 30 to keep that onto your chamber. Yeah, you're right. I think it probably depends on what we're doing. Like, for example, if we're doing a goniotomy, uh, I think that, you know, you can pressurize the eye because you want to keep the, you know, the blood reflex back. But stenting, where we want to be in the canal, want the canal to be dilated, I think we're probably better off being like more like less than 10, just keeping it relatively soft. But I think you make really good points about uh, pressurization and about viscoelastic. Mm -hmm. Any, any other pearls for those learning? You, you kind of you kind of been doing this now for for you know around six months or more. You've learned a lot a lot along the way. Any really important things you wish you knew maybe before you actually started? Well, more than that, I think here we have access to a lot of mix, but in other places and most commonly we don't have that much access. So I think if you're starting to learn how to do a lot of mixed procedures, I think it's better to just stick to one. So get a lot of patients one day and not just do one mixed procedure, let's say an eye stent. Try to get pa maybe three, five patients, ideally more if you can. That way whenever, when the rep comes, you can just ask all the questions that you need and get comfortable with one technique. Because I feel like each mix has its own learning curve and uh, its own technique. So it would be better to just have one day specifically for one, get comfortable and then come up with the next uh, the next OR day I'm picking another mixed procedure instead of just having one OR day with different ones. Jeb? Um, one other thing that I think may sound really basic, right, but I don't think all residents really get that proper kind of instruction is even just your microscope, right, properly what we always say X, Y, make sure you're properly centered and then magnification, enough magnification so you're really seeing the structures very nicely, right, and I don't think that's something that we always think about, we think it's so basic, um, but it can honestly sometimes be such a, it can make that much of a difference. Well, thank you to both of you for sharing great pearls on learning MIGS. Both of you have been doing MIGS now for a number of months. You've learned a lot. I think you've shared some great pearls. I hope you find that useful. You know, MIGS is definitely here to stay. It's given us a great addition to our therapies for glaucoma. There are some important pearls we've heard about today, about visualization, about positioning the patient, hand position, and your view. Stay tuned for more MIGS. We've got a lot more episodes. Stay tuned for more MIGS Unplugged.